It's very good that I arrived here with time to spare from the Kessinger campus because it's too hot to be stressing out uh, about getting here on time. Let's pray together before we open God's Word. Father, we thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. We've come to your table and been reminded through bread and cup of your great sacrifice. We've been singing your praises, and now we come to your word, and we ask you to speak to us. And open our hearts that we might hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1988, a U.S. company that had, was around $877 million annually in sales launched a marketing campaign that would take them in the next 10 years from under $900 million to over $9 billion. In sales, and the, and the campaign was centered around three simple words. Do you know the company? Nike. And the words? Just do it. Some of you know that, right? Th 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 those three words became a nationwide slogan. Even for those who aren't fanatics about sports, that became, uh, everybody knew the phrase just do it. It captivated our imaginations. Why? What is it about just do it that so captivated us? Well, let me ask this question. How many of you have things in your life that you intended to do, planned to do, wanted to do, but just have not gotten around to doing them. Anybody? <laughs> Me too. I've got notebooks full of ideas that I haven't ever done. Things I want to do. Something about the simplicity, the straightforward nature, even the challenging nature of just do it. I like it. I get it. It encourages and challenges me. The section we're going to look at in the letter of James is really kind of like James's version of just do it, where James talks about the, the connection between faith and works. Now, we're in a series, as you saw, called Street Level Faith. And what that means is James wrote this letter to Christians. James, by the way, if you haven't been with us, is the younger half-brother of Jesus, who did not believe in Jesus when he was walking the earth, when Jesus was, but became his follower after Jesus' death and resurrection. And James is a straightforward guy. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't pull any punches. He's very direct. And he's not as concerned with deep theology or doctrinal uh, nitpicking. His primary concern is, he sort of assumes you believe in Jesus. And then it's his, his concern is, what does that look like in your life, street-level faith? What does genuine faith look like, look like in action? That's what he's getting at. And the passage we're going to look at here is one that Christians have divided over and hotly debated for centuries. So let's look at James 2, verses 14 through 26. Verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works, is dead. I told you James is direct. He calls you foolish and dead and useless. Now, again, he's primarily concerned in his letter with what does authentic faith in Jesus Christ look like? And he makes a statement, a couple of statements, but one in particular, that sounds like a direct contradiction to much of what the rest of the New Testament teaches. This is the problem of faith. At least, the apparent problem of faith. Now, we're always talking here at Chapel Street Church about experienced grace, meaning you come to know the saving work of Jesus Christ in your life by surrendering and receiving that gift. We talked at VBS, over 100 children made a decision to trust Jesus. They responded to the message of grace. Now we follow them up and help them grow in their understanding of who God is. And so we talk that grace can only be received. You don't earn God's favor. You don't achieve it. You don't acquire it by your effort. You receive it as a gift. 
But James seems to be saying the opposite, doesn't he? This is the problem or apparent problem of faith. In verse 24, James 2.24, James says, and this is probably the center verse of, of where the controversy for many Christians has been. In verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The word justified is a Bible word for being made right with. How does a man or woman get set right with God? How does that happen? How do we get put right with God? How are we justified in the sight of God? Paul says something different than James. Listen to what Paul says in, or apparently in Romans 3, 28. He says something that sounds very different than what James says. He says, for we, uh, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. What does James say? 3.20, go backwards to one, one verse for a minute. James says, verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Paul says, you're justified by faith apart from works. Well, how, these, how can this go together? This is where the, you see the controversy now? Or maybe Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, some of you are more familiar with that. It is not that you, by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves, not by works of righteousness so that none of you could boast. So which is it? Saved by works or saved by faith? Well, James and Paul are actually, they're not contradicting each other, and they're friends. James, Paul went to visit James to be commissioned in a way by him, be taught by him, to be encouraged by him, to share what God is doing in the church with James in Jerusalem on more than one occasion. So they don't hate each other, they're not at odds. They're actually answering like two different questions about the same issue. Kind of like if, if I went to the, see my doctor and he said, you know, you ought, to, you ought to exercise more, which he did say actually, by the way, right? <laughs> you know, you're getting a little heavy, you ought, to, you ought to exercise more. But maybe you are in pretty good shape and you have a stress fracture in your foot, but you're addicted to exercise. You go to the same doctor, my doctor, and he says, you need to slow down, rest, and stop exercising. Well, this doctor's contradicting himself. Same doctor, he's given two different words, but different issues. Paul is not addressing the same question or the same issue James is. Paul is addressing the question of how does a person get made right with God? How does somebody who's far from God and dead in their sins become alive in Christ and get justified before God? James is saying, how does a person who is justified live? What does it look like for you once you are made right with God? They're looking at this from different angles, as it were. Paul is talking about how we get justified in James, about what our justified life looks like, how we know we're justified. Charles Spurgeon, in his great sermon on this passage, wrote, It is not the presence of the apple which makes the tree alive. It is the live tree which produces the apple. See, you, that's a great way of understanding the connection here. An apple on a tree doesn't make the tree alive, but it's evidence that the tree is alive. You see a tree without any leaves or any apples, you have a pretty good indication that tree is dead or dying. James is making the argument here, not that works save you or earn God's favor, but you have God's favor in Christ, therefore, what does that look like? What is the evidence of that? Now, this might sound subtle, but it's a very significant distinction that many, many people get wrong in our minds and in our hearts. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, It's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, not by works, so nobody could boast. And 2, 10 is for works of righteousness, right, which God prepared beforehand in advance for you to walk in. 2, 8, and 9 is Paul. Verse 10 is James. They're in agreement. All right, so what does this authentic, genuine faith actually look like? The first thing James describes is saving faith. By implication, he's saying you can have a kind of faith that does not save, which is a little bit unsettling. We'll talk about that. Saving faith. In verse 14, James says, what good is it, my brothers? This is the first question. He has two questions in this verse. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And he says then, this is not listed there, but it should be. He says, can such faith save him? That's the last part of verse 14. And then he answers his own question in verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 17. Now between those two verses, James gives a little hypothetical scenario, which is, he does this earlier in chapter 2 other places as well. He says, what good is it, same question again, my brothers, if, if you pass by a brother or sister, now in this scenario, brother or sister means fellow believer in Christ, Meaning you see somebody who you either know by name or you know well enough to know they belong to Jesus. So it's not the anonymous poor person. It's someone you know, in, brother or sister, in the, in the family of Christ. And they don't have 
They're not well clothed. Now, in English, that sounds like they shopped at Walmart. That's not what it means. It, means, it doesn't mean they're like they're wearing a knockoff brand. It means they don't have enough clothing to keep them warm. They're exposed to the elements. And they don't have food for the day. They're starving. You pass by somebody who you know belongs to Jesus, who does not have clothes on their back or food in their stomach, and you say, God bless you. Go in peace. I hope you have a great lunch today. You know what you should do? Stop skipping meals. That's a good idea. God bless you. It sounds ridiculous, right? Doesn't it sound almost like who would do that? James says it's equally ridiculous for the person who says, I believe in Jesus, but there's no evidence at all in my life. You know, we talked about over 100 children. I presume you've made that, who, who made a decision to trust in Jesus at VBS. Well, now we follow them up and teach them and disciple them and instruct them so they understand what that decision was. But 20 years from now, if there's nothing changes, just a once upon a time I prayed some prayer. I can't look at someone's heart and judge them, but James is saying you cannot meet Jesus, really. You can know about him, you can read about him, but you can't really meet him and not change. Jesus changes things. That's what he does. And if there's no change in your life at all, then we have reason to say, I, maybe I haven't met him. Maybe it was just an emotional response once upon a time at VBS years ago. If you're the same anxious, fearful, embittered, resentful, unforgiving, ungenerous person 20 years from now, it's an issue, he's saying. It's an issue right to the core of your faith. It's not, just saying you have faith doesn't save you. Years ago, I was asked to be an adjunct professor for one semester of one class at Wheaton College to undergrad students in the Christian education major. I, the, the professor that was on sabbatical, the backup took ill, and they, I think they couldn't find anybody to do this, so they asked me. And so I was teaching a class twice a week, early in the morning, on the Bible and ministry. So my, I was walking or, from the, the Billy Graham Center parking lot to the Billy Graham Center, which is where the class was held, for my very first class. And I, you know, I didn't know how good a teacher I was, but I stopped by Dunkin' Donuts and bought like three big boxes of donuts and got some coffee because I figured, you, you know, these are college students, it's early in the morning, I could win with, with this. So I'm walking up the steps to my very first class, got my bag over my shoulder with my notes and got coffee in one hand and a box of donuts in the other, and I... It's cold out, it's November, I think, right? and I pass uh, by the first doors, and in the vestibule, between the outer doors and the inner doors, there's a man uh, in the corner huddled up, and he's clearly not a college student or a professor. He's uh, somebody from the streets who's just kind of trying to get out of the wind and the cold. He's in the corner there. And I, you know, I pass by him because i got to go teach a class about the Bible and ministry to students. So I get in the elevator, I press the button with my elbow, got my stuff, and I'm riding the elevator up, you know, because i got to get upstairs to teach my class about ministry and how I use the Bible to minister to people. And I get into my classroom, I put my donuts down, get my notes out, and it's like God says to me, you idiot! Now, he doesn't, does he, maybe he doesn't call you idiot, sometimes he calls me idiot. It's loving when he says it, but he does call me idiot sometimes. He's like, he says, what is your problem? Oh yeah. So I took donuts and coffee, got back in the elevator, went back downstairs and went to that man and gave him a donut and some coffee talk to him a little bit. And it's not like angels sang and his life changed right there. It was a simple act of kindness, though, that I would have walked right by and probably have many times. But God got my attention. Is your heart increasingly open to people who are hurting? Do you care more about the needs of others than you used to? Do you see people a little differently than you used to? Do you begin to see them in the way God sees them? Not all the time, God's not looking for perfection, but progress here. That's evidence of a saved life, of a forgiven heart. That's evidence you belong to Jesus. That's what James is saying. But if that's not changing, if you only are concerned about yourself all the time, that's a problem. Now, it's no coincidence that James uses this scenario. It's the same one he uses in chapter 1. He says, authentic faith is this, care for the poor, widows, and orphans. And later in chapter, earlier in chapter 2, he talks about a different hypothetical situation when a rich man and a poor man walk into church. We talked about this last week. And you favor one over the other. John, 1 John 3, verse 17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how can God's love abide in him? Now James is not saying this is how you earn God's favor. Let me be clear again. 
He's not saying, this is how you make God pleased with you. This is how you know, make God love you. It's, he's saying, if you have been forgiven and set free by Christ, and you are loved eternally by him, how can you not care for the people God cares about? Now, in the very next verse, James anticipates an argument from somebody who hears this. And I'm gonna, I, I made some changes to the sermon order, so it's not his fault. I mixed it all up. Right? Um, he, if you go to verses 18 and 19, James 2, 18 and 19, I'll read these for you. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Now what that means is somebody, he's anticipating a person who would object saying, well, faith and works are separate, James. Don't connect them at all. They're different things entirely. And James' answer to this objection is typically straightforward and direct. He says, you show me, you say you have faith, I'll show you mine by what I do. He gets right in somebody's face with this. Maybe James is passive aggressive here. Maybe when he says somebody might say, maybe he knows who's going to say this. Maybe it's like, you know, Lee might say this, right? But it, probably not. He's just anticipating how that people might object to this, and he's saying they are intimately linked. You can't separate them. James' response is, show me. This is what the chair means, right? Now, this is the same chair that in the lobby there that you sit on, and I, I, I weigh, well, I weigh well over 200 pounds. <laughs> Let's leave it there, right? So, you know, this chair holds me up. Just fine. No creaking. No. I've sat in chairs. My wife buys antique chairs sometimes to decorate her house, and I have zero faith in those chairs. <laughs> right? They just look nice. I'm not sitting in that chair. I've made the mistake before. I went to a graduation party years ago uh, to a young girl when I was a high school pastor. Went on the deck and sat in this nice little chair and just shattered underneath me. <laughs> so that's so why I'm careful. But this chair holds me. It's well constructed. It's put together well. And so I think if I asked you, well, do you believe this, this chair would hold you? Yes. Well, why do you believe that? Well, I, I saw you sit in it. I've seen it before. I know how it's put together. I intellectually believe in the properties of the chair and its construction so that I, that I believe it would hold me up. Okay, have a seat. Well, can we just talk, stand and talk? Have a seat. Well, I don't want to sit because you know, I've had some bad experiences in the past with chairs, and I'm not sure I want to sit in that chair. I mean, I believe it will hold me. Have a seat. This is what James is saying. Now, this is his point in verse 19. Listen to verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. The, word, the phrase God is one is, is a reference to the Shema, the central Hebrew prayer. The hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's writing to Jews that are now believers in Christ who are scattered. So you believe that God is one, good for you. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. A.W. Tozer says the devil is a better theologian than any of us, and he is a devil still. Meaning, the, Jonathan Edwards writes in depth about this in one of his sermons on this passage, saying that the demons in the New Testament, when you study the New Testament, they recognize who Jesus is, they call him by the right title, and they acknowledge his authority over them. When the disciples are confused about Jesus, who, who he really is, the demons are not. But they're not saved. They don't have a relationship with him. Grace hasn't penetrated, right? In other words, his, James's point is this. Mere intellectual assent to right doctrine does not save you. Now, that's hard for some of you to hear. Knowing chapter and verse of the Bible does not save you. Being able to give the right answers to theological questions does not in and of itself save you. Those are good things, and we should aspire to them, but they aren't saving faith. I believe in the properties of the chair. I intellectually agree that this chair will hold me. But I'm not sitting there. You see? James is saying, you say you have faith, but just say it. I will show you by what I do. Have a seat, in other words. Take a seat. Step into the grace and love of God. Trust him. Take him at his word and see. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is the point he's making. Next, befriending faith. The demons have good theology, but what they don't know is what awaits all of us who have stepped into and sat down the love of God. The relationship, the love and the peace and the joy. James gives us a couple of fascinating examples in the Old Testament the, to illustrate this point. The first one would be not surprising, right? It's Abraham. These are Jews he's writing to who have become Christians. 
He's, he uses his father Abraham. How many of you grew up in Sunday school and know the Father Abraham song? Let's sing it together, shall we? Father Abraham had many sons. Do this. Many sons had father. You're not doing it. Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left leg, whatever you do. I don't remember. Right? You see, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. You're like, what is happening right now? Right? We sing songs about Father Abraham. He's the father of our faith. But the other example is Rahab. Do you remember Rahab the prostitute song? <laughs> Rahab the prostitute. No, you don't remember it because there is not one. Right? And this is kind of James's point. He's using two extreme examples, right? The patriarch, the father of our faith. Yes, of course. The prostitute? The pagan? She's not even a Jew. What do they share? What possible connection do these two have? They both trusted God at his word and did something with it. They both took action. And James, it's not accidental. He's saying it doesn't matter your background, your pedigree, your upbringing, your family, your education, the church you grew up in or didn't grow up in. What matters is do you trust God at his word and do you take a seat in his grace? Do you step into that life? Or is it purely intellectual for you? Is it merely theoretical and hypothetical for you? This is befriending faith. Let's read verses 21 to 23. Verse 21, the example of Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. That phrase, a friend of God, it's beautiful. We used to sing a song in the contemporary services called, I am a friend of God, he calls me friend. Just as in a little side, Scott Salvati, his little boy, Nicky, when Nick was, Nick's out of college now, when he was a young boy, used to think, he said, Dad, why does God call me Fred? He thought we're singing, he calls me Fred. <laughs> That's not, uh, that's funny. <laughs> not Fred, friend. A friend of God. Well, how, you get, how does that happen? How does one become a friend of God? James quotes Genesis 15, verse 6, which is the, the key verse. By the way, Apostle Paul quotes this several times in the New Testament. Abraham believed God, that's faith, and it was counted to him as righteousness, that's justification, made right with God. I believe God, faith, and that is credited to me as, but how do we know Abraham believed God? How do we know? Well, he said so. No. He did something. Specifically, he references Genesis 22. Years after Genesis 15, 6. Now, Abraham, if you know the story, you hear our beautiful little baby crying back there. Like Abraham and Sarah were old, 99 and 95, and they can't have children. And God promises them a son. I'm going to bless you through an heir. But there's no heir coming. And they're old and wrinkly and shriveled up and way past barren children. And God says, I'm going to come through. And he does. And Isaac, the son of the promise, is born to them. Like the tangible, living, breathing, walking, talking symbol of God's faithfulness and goodness and, and being true to his word. And then God says to Abraham, take that child, your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him up. Now, we don't have time to get into this. It's a troubling passage. But Abraham does. And his son even questions it. And Abraham says, God himself will provide. I don't know how. I don't know when, but God will come through. And God does. Provides a substitute on the mountain. A ram caught in a thicket. That whole story is pointing to the great substitute, which we just celebrated here. When not Abraham, but the Father, our Father, who art in heaven, offered up his son, his only son, whom he loved, as a substitute in your place, so that you and I could be called his friends, his sons, his daughters, friends of God. By faith in the substitute of Jesus Christ. This is, so James is not confused in the gospel. He gets it. He's saying, do you get it? And if you do, that ought to look, that ought to, your life ought to look different. If you get it. This is befriending faith. Faith is a relational word, friends. Faith is not something you pray at VBS and then put it in your back pocket and then when you get to the pearly gates you go, got faith. It's, it's every moment of every day. This is the last point, living faith. Faith is not static, it's dynamic, it's active, and it's growing. God is looking for progress in you, not perfection, as I said before. He's inviting you into a life lived by faith. Listen to the way that chapter 2 closes in James chapter 2, verse 26. 
For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Do you remember in our series on the Holy Spirit, we talked about the Ruach of God, which breathes life into your flesh, and without the Spirit of God, you're dead, like actually dead. To lose your Ruach is a bummer. It means you die, right? But the Spirit gives you life. James is saying that same principle applies to faith and works. They go together. Faith without works is just talk. How many of you study the, the love languages? The five love languages? Yeah, right? My wife's love languages are uh, acts of service and quality time. You know what mine are? Words of affirmation and physical touch. So I'm always walking around, mm, I love you, I love you. And she's like, yeah, talk is cheap, buddy. Right? <laughs> she doesn't say that, but yeah, you know. Right. The, the James, in a way, is saying, like, you know, it's just talk otherwise. Living faith. And by the way, James is echoing what we read in Galatians 2.20 when the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives me in the life that I live now in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Romans 1.17, he says, The righteous shall live by faith. And we'll skip over the next couple of verses. There's not time to get into all of them. Life by faith, in other words. It doesn't end with your salvation. We use the phrase, take a step of faith, don't we? There's a little boy named Eli Miller. Eli's dad is Alex. Alex works for the King County Cougars, and that's one of our connections to have stadium service there. And Eli's about, I don't know, six or seven years old, and I'll go over there next hour right from here to preach the sermon over at the Kessler campus. And after that sermon, if they're in town, he does the same thing every Sunday after service. He comes right down the front. He waits for me to finish talking or praying with people, and then he gets on the stage, and all the musicians are clearing off their instruments, and he goes back by the drum kit, like way back here, and he gets down like this in a stance, and he goes one, two, three, and he just starts sprinting to the end of the stage. Now, it's not like nice and sloped like this. It just, it just cuts off, right, if you've been there. And he just comes to the end of the stage, and he leaps like this, and I catch him. The first time we did this, his mom was like, ha, 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 oh, you know. Like, <laughs> but now it's like a tradition, right? Maybe when he's 15, I'll stop doing this, probably before that, right? <laughs> He does not slow, he does not, he doesn't flinch. It's full speed, full leap into my arms. Never questions that Pastor Jeff will catch him. I better not drop him. It would damage his faith, right? <laughs> but uh, Eli has become like a little living parable to me. I want to be like him when I grow up. I want to be like that with God. I'm not really always. But I want to run full speed into his arms. Whatever he says to me, I want to do that, Right? Whatever God wants for me, that's what I want to do. And I don't always. I mean, I do what you do probably. I run, uh, 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 and I slow down at the edge. And I go, uh, uh, you know. Let's go back to this chair for a minute. This chair doesn't just mean salvation, friends. This chair means whatever God is asking you to do, will you obey him? Maybe you're in a relationship, maybe it's a family relationship or a friend, and it's broken right now. And God is telling you to forgive, and you're withholding it. Or he's telling you to ask for forgiveness and you're too proud to do it. I, whatever. Maybe you have a relationship and God is calling you to do something. And you're, you're saying, well, I believe in forgiveness. I believe this is a good idea. Take a seat, right? Or maybe it's your finances. Maybe God is, maybe you're struggling and you are not, you, God is saying, trust me to provide. Or maybe for many of us in this culture, God is saying, be generous. And this is not pastoral guilt to give. We already did that, right? This is... God is saying, you're in prison to your need for stuff, and I want to free you, so be generous. Will you have a seat? Will you trust me? Maybe it's your work. I know some people that are out of work right now. I know some brothers I just saw last hour who have lost jobs. Whatever it is, what is God calling you to do? Will you trust him? Will you do it? Because what good is it, friends, if you say, well, I believe that God is trustworthy. I believe that God can come through. I believe God will bless me. I believe, blah, blah, blah. But I don't do anything about it. Can such faith produce anything in you? Have a seat, right? Sit down in his love and his grace. Trust him at his word. Taste and see, the psalmist says. Chapel Street Church, I want for, for me, and, for, and I don't preach this as somebody who's arrived there. I'm in process like you are. That's what I want for us. I want you to be so convinced of the love of God for you. Not just intellectually, but so convinced that it just spills out of your life. And you can't not trust God. You can't not do something with it. You can't sit still because of it. And I don't mean 
for the, however long he preaches. I mean, in your life, when you leave here with the people on your street that you work with, that you're connected with, give your life away because you're so convinced, that's faith, that God loves you. You know it. How can you not trust him? How can we not trust him? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this ancient book, this simple and direct book, this letter written right to our hearts today. We, like so many, intellectually believe things, say things, know things, but you're calling us into a life lived by faith, faith marked with action because we trust you, because we're safe in your love. Thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our friend. Amen.